Gunjan, you're on mute. Oh, hi. Welcome, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to be sharing this panel uh, on navigating risks in a disrupted world. The timing of this conversation could not be better in terms of where the world is today. And that we are all experiencing uh, significant disruptions. And disruptions is the name of the day. When you look at what has happened over the last couple of years in terms of the pandemic, the COVID, COVID uh, challenge that the society and the world has faced at large, uh, or you look at the geopolitical risks you know, emerging right now in Europe and globally, uh, those are significant challenges in front of the society, the civic society, countries, nations, individuals, and businesses. Uh, uh, but besides the COVID, the pandemic, the geopolitical issues, also the technology disruptions. I really want to bring to attention what's happening in a world which is going more into the digital cyber world and actually creating more digital divide, uh, not less which was the you know, failed promise of technology to become the, creating the utopian society of creating value for all. Um, but last, not the least, besides COVID issues and the pandemic, the geopolitical and technology, I also think that the climate issues are significant risks to the planet at large. So these disruptions that are in front of us, uh, staring at us and glaring at us, is the perfect backdrop for this conversation uh, and I feel we have to collectively look at this as interconnected risks. We have an esteemed panel here today uh, with me joining our, uh, our Mikhail Trevichit. He's 20 plus years in global factoring, has done a number of uh, uh, innovations in, in Russia, in Vietnam, in India, joining me from Moscow. Hi, Mikhail. How are you Hi. doing? I am yeah, and uh, Mikhail is also leading an organization called OmniGrade Universal Crowdsourcing Agency, which is an international crowdsourcing platform to help us find answers for both corporations and, and public and private sectors in terms of leveraging the crowdsourcing platform for real innovation and answers to difficult problems and solutions. And with me also today is is uh, from right here in California, is Bill Davidov. And Bill is one of the earliest innovators, as I know, growing up here in Silicon Valley, uh, as a founder of More Davidov, which is one of the leading venture capital firms in Silicon Valley and around the world. He has also co-authored a number of books. Uh, and I remember reading his book, The Virtual Corporation, very early on. And now... I'm looking forward to his book on the autonomous revolution, and we will talk about that. Uh, earlier, prior to uh, uh, Mo Davidao, uh, Bill was also an executive and leading sales and marketing initiatives at Intel Corporation. So, Bill, hi, welcome to the to the panel here with me. So, a real pleasure to have you. Uh, so, uh, so with that backdrop, uh, we uh, I, I want to. See if I'm able to communicate here with uh, Muzamil. Muzamil, can you hear me? No. Uh, so I think we are having some technical challenge here. Uh, we'll see if uh, Muzamil is able to join us. Uh, he leads the African Trade Alliance. Uh, he's all the way from Sudan. A very important perspective in terms of how to think about multinational investments coming into Africa and the future of Africa uh, and how you think about strategic investments, in, especially in economic industries that highlight natural resources, a very, very germane topic for us at this point of time. He's also a vice curator at the Global Shapers uh, for the World Economic Forum. So uh, hopefully uh, we are able to get him live uh, uh, today. But let's get going in interest of time. Uh, and I'm going to open up my conversation for... Uh, Mikhail, and you know, uh, from Moscow, on as I give the backdrop of how the disruptions, whether those are the disruptions around the the pandemic, the geopolitical, the technology, you know, as it creates more divides, and the climate. How do you see these as 
connected risks for the business, for the cyber society, the, you know, the, the world at large, and at also at an individual level, at a personal level. And, uh, that's something that gets overlooked by the risk professionals. And how do you think about the risks as you are sitting here in 2022 and going forward? So I'll turn it over to you, Mikhail. Uh, thank you so much. I think that um, two years ago, uh, when uh, uh, f- first time we heard about the COVID-19 pandemic, we faced with the risk uh, we never uh, uh, thought about in last several uh, decades. So uh, this risk was very unpredictable. Maybe only um, a Hollywood uh, movies writers uh, uh, who was the authors of some movies about uh, big pandemics uh, 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 could predict such a risk in the past. Unfortunately, we also uh, uh, are facing now with the risk of war, which was also very unpredictable because uh, the the, uh, history of Europe and history of uh, 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 modern civilized world was peaceful history for for the last uh, um, 60, 70 years. So uh, uh, my first conclusion is that uh, the most serious and the most dangerous risks today are unpredictable. Uh, and we need to find a tool how to predict the risks and how to develop an action plan uh, to uh, decrease the level of risks, decrease the level of this unpredictable and maybe hidden risks at the moment. And as you mentioned, uh, uh, at the moment, I was very much involved in different crowdsourcing projects, and I am uh, the founder of the crowdsourcing agency. And crowdsourcing might be one of the tools to uh, find uh, these hidden risks and to attract the attention of the business community or social community to some new risks and also to find the most creative and uh, solution how to ma- uh, to assess the risks and how to manage the risks and how to decrease uh, uh, the risks. Uh, and uh, it it could be one of the most efficient tools uh, in uh, modern risk management. My right. second point is that uh, uh, risks are not only the business of risk managers, if we take, for instance, the business. So the CEOs of the company also have to think about the risks every day. And uh, risk are also a personal issue for all human beings in this world. For instance, if we take the pandemic, uh, it was and still is the personal decision for every man or every woman to go today to trade center, to shopping center, to cinema, not to go, if there are no official restrictions from authorities. Because uh, it is a risk to go, because it is the threat uh, to get the virus. But maybe it is the risk not to go, because it's also dangerous in terms of uh, uh, ability of a lot of people to develop their cognitive skills, to get new useful contacts, and uh, to help uh, themselves to develop their personal social life. So uh, uh, our time is the time of new meaning of risks and new tools for uh, management of risks. Wonderful. Now, thank you for your uh, insightful views, Mikhail. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, as you've noted, the, the, the crowdsourcing has and could be a platform to provide some real critical answers in the, in the age of disruptions and risks here. Uh, let me let me. Ask Bill, you know, as I talked about, you know, the disruptions, you know, across COVID, geopolitical technology, you know, and the climate and looking at it, you know, not just from a business perspective, but, you know, business, the digital cyber, the climate, and also at the individual level, how do you see this 
and you know the risks to be defined as you're sitting here in 2022 and moving and looking ahead well thank you uh in the largest social experiment ever conducted by humanity, five billion of us are immigrating to virtual space from the physical world. We're psychologically maladapted to this environment. In the virtual world, depression, anxiety, narcissism, suspicion, drug use, and polarization flourish, undermining the mental health of millions of the immigrants to virtual space and the orderly functioning of our social and economic and government institutions. <coughs> Humans are adapted to physical space. Homo sapiens evolved in physical space 300,000 years ago, and we have shaped it to serve our needs. Physical space has no purpose. The sun that grows our crops, the water that we drink, and the air we breathe have no strategic goals. Virtual space has purposes, goals, and objectives. Many of its creators and controllers use it to influence human behavior and make money. Their goal is to monetize the value of user time spent in virtual space. This agenda drives the growth of virtual space, the increase in mental illness and disease, and undermines the functioning of many of our institutions. When we take up residence in this environment, our brains, minds, emotions, and body chemistry function differently. As a result, many of us display symptoms associated with mild, moderate, or severe mental disorders. The key to evolving, avoiding these problems is learning how to manage our behavior and time spent in virtual space. We must use it as a tool rather than as an environment in which we live. In virtual space, for example, we deal with threats very differently. After all, a tiger will not have us for dinner in virtual space. Our senses evolved in, able, in order in, <clears throat> to enable us to find food and sense threats, and so that we could take action in order to survive. When our senses become aware of a threatening situation in physical space, they immediately send a message to our autonomous nervous system that triggers our flight fight response within about 50 milliseconds. Cortisol is released in our blood system and our uh, physical system and our heart rate climbs. The message is sent to our amygdala and the amygdala triggers a fear emotion and in a more leisurely way, talks to our cerebral cortex. Now our mind goes to work to come up with a well thought out strategy for uh, <coughs> threat reduction. Soon we find ourselves climbing a tree to get away from the bear. So that's the way our mind works in the physical world. Now let's see what happens to um, in, in the virtual world. Remember that in our physical world, the cerebral cortex is a threat avoidance strategy uh, a mechanism for us. We respond to threats very differently in a virtual world. Virtual threats are for the most part invisible to our senses or so well camouflaged we do not see them. Our sense of smell will not uh, detect a fake website, and it looks like a real and trusted thing to our eyes. So in place of our senses in virtual space, using our senses to threat, to sense threats, we use our cerebral cortex to identify threats. We, <clears throat> when we receive a suspicious email, we do threat detection by analysis. Our cerebral cortex then functions differently it becomes our primary threat sensing mechanism. Constantly searching for threats and being overly suspicious are symptoms commonly associated with paranoia, psychosis, and anxiety. Our threat searching habits in virtual space <clears throat> may be associated with the increase in conspiracy theories. The proper way to use virtual space is as a tool 
to improve our lives. If we use it in this fashion, <clears throat> then uh, we can live richer lives that is associated with life in virtual space. So um, we've got to learn how to use virtual space differently. No, that's, Bill, that's perfect backdrop. And I love the way you kind of looked at the risk issue much more at a, you know, individual neurological, you know, mental health at the mental health level and how threats can permeate right at an individual level as you look at the macro, whether, you know, it's emerging from the risks of the pandemic or geopolitical or whether it's related to digital cyber uh, or even other bigger risks like climate risks and so forth. The question that I would have and build, you know, maybe you can give us some insights into this is how should you think that they sh we should be guiding the public sector and the private sector to collaborate here in this heightened state of you know political economic social but also digital uncertainty that uh, you touched upon you talk about in your book about the autonomous revolution and the digital divides that's being accelerating because of robots and auto uh, uh, automation and so forth how do you see the two sides the public sector and the private sector coming together to guide the future in a way that's going to be more rational, less fear-driven, and, and more productive. Okay. All right. Well, I would do this sort of at a policy level. And um, uh, 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 we're, we're, we're trying to pass rules and use inspection to get rid of problems. And, uh, and, there, and uh, you know, so Facebook has... 15,000 people monitoring its website. And the real problem is we've made one to many communications, zero cost. And it's a very, very valuable commodity. And so uh, it, people have found ways to abuse that. Uh, for example, because one to many communications is so cheap, setting up conspiracy websites becomes profitable, becomes a profitable business. So I would try to make one-to-many communications more expensive and less efficient. And think of it this way. We reduced the cost of one-to-many communications, I'm going to say by a million. If we had reduced the cost of one-to-many communications by a factor of 10, we would have thought this was wonderful. And... Um, and uh, people would have, be using it very differently. For example, uh, every day, I think there are 3 billion spam emails sent out uh, to uh, trick us into going to websites and revealing various information. If it cost a penny to send each one of those emails, that would be a cost of, uh, what, $30 million a day? and uh, or a, a billion dollars a year uh, to send spam emails and um, it, it wouldn't be profitable to do it yeah no in fact you bring a good point on the on the taxation to the one to many in fact i'll reverse the the concept that i think mikhail is on with the crowdsourcing which is like what i would call many to one you know uh where you can have the wisdom of the crowd to come out with one communication one solution one problem solving uh, and uh, Mikhail, do you want to comment on this whole concept of one-to-many uh, communication and its toll on the society uh, it, and, and what, how it's affecting, but your reverse approach of taking the crowd and turning them, solving one problem, how does that play out? Uh, uh, Go ahead, uh, please. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, I'd like to point out that not all crowdsourcing projects uh, can be successful. One of the most important criteria for crowdsourcing to be successful is the diversity of crowd. So you need to have people from different countries, ideally, with different professional and life backgrounds, male, female, young, old people, people with different mentality, with different life experience. And in this case, they can bring on the table different opinions, 
different solution to the most complicated and the most important issues and challenges. So you will, in this case, you will have a variety of different solutions. And you will be able to choose the most efficient, uh, the most creative, and the most promising solution. And it is more efficient way than you ask a consultant or you ask your employee or you, you ask uh, another company to find the solution. Because in the case of crowdsourcing, you will have the variety of solutions. And if you need, for instance, to find, to develop an action plan, how to decrease very serious risk of threat, or to find new way of the development for new industry on new science or whatever, this opportunity to analyze different possible solutions, different ideas from the crowd, from diversified crowd, which is very important, is probably one of the most efficient way to find, uh, I would say, even genius solutions to the most complicated problems. Yeah. No, thank you, Mikhail, for that perspective. And uh, I, 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 I was list reflecting on the comment, you know, Bill, you made on the one to many, you know, in a society where everybody is communicating outward, and it creates more communication than people can process, and that's the data overload problem that the society is experiencing. And and in in that world, you know, when you look at how it amplifies people's perception of risks and actual risks you know that becomes a real issue here so so uh, so so one recommendation that what i'm hearing from you bill is that figuring out some ways to take a toll or tax on how your communication is thought of in this world of the social networks metaverse and other virtual cyber uh, digital spaces is, is going to be one of the techniques are there some other thoughts or recommendations bill from your side uh no. looking at the public policy yeah, I mean, it, 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 you, you just like to make the system less efficient. So if I own my own personal information and you couldn't use it for pinpoint targeting to me, uh, it makes the system less efficient and it preserves my privacy. So that's one thing that would uh, make one-to-many communication less disruptive. Um, and the other thing I'd like to point out is that we have never had free speech. Uh, it, 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 the free market controls free speech because I could say whatever I wanted, but it was like yelling from the mountaintop. Nobody heard me. If I wanted to get my message out, I, in the past, I had to use mass communications, and it, it was edited. Or I had to spend a lot of money to run the ads or things like that. And so um, we lost a market control over free speech that we had in the past. And so free speech today is totally uncontrolled. Yeah. Uh, let me ask you, Muzamil, thank you. Thank you, Bill. Muzamil, are you able to hear us? Are you able to... Uh, uh, no? I think he's still having technical problems. So anyway, we'll, we'll keep our conversation going here. Bill, I could not agree with you more. Let me change the tack here. When you look at where we sit here, and I want to touch the climate topic here, you know, it's been fairly well understood, the risks that are there to the planet at large. And there's a lot of conversations around ESG, environmental social governance as a social responsibility for businesses, for investors, uh, and and how we should think about our carbon. Sorry, uh, Mr. are you able to hear us? No. Okay. No. So I was talking about the climate and and the ESG, the environmental social governance, something that pe businesses and uh, the society at large are thinking about environmental and social governance at, as as a as as a concept that people are now doubling down on. How do you see that come together? And, and let me define ESG, which is environmental, which is climate, social, which be social topics like from diversity to you know gender equality to to uh, you know how the businesses take care of the society. 
and is showing complete responsibility and society becomes a stakeholder for businesses and the overall governance of that. Uh, what kind of opportunities or risks that you see as you think about ESG and climate change uh, as it pertains for businesses to participate in and actually take a proactive approach and not just wait on governments to play the role here? So, um, so let me let me ask Mikhail for his remarks, and then Bill, you can follow up that. Mikhail, yeah, uh, I think that's a very important uh, topic. And uh, if we, we we take, uh, for instance, the pandemic, unfortunately, we don't know exactly what were the reasons of the appearance of this uh, coronavirus, but most likely, uh, some reasons were very much linked with. Um, uh, ecological changes, with climate changes, uh, uh, and because they uh, force the animals to migrate um, uh, from their native areas uh, more close to uh, human beings. And even if the, uh, uh, this virus was not exactly uh, linked with the changes of the climate, some new epidemics could be uh, forced by climate changes. Also, if you take social issues, uh, 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 it's very much uh, connected with some problems of organization. Uh, a lot of cities are overcrowded. If you take and they're overcrowded because a lot of social issues are not solved. And it is very, unfortunately, it creates very comfortable uh, conditions for the spread of uh, viruses and other diseases. So if people are not managed to uh, solve this, uh, first of all, environment and social issues, faced with a lot of threats, dangerous to businesses and dangerous to society. And that's why we need to find um, the solution how to solve these issues. I'd like to tell just a few words about our project called the City of the Future. It was sponsored by one of the, our clients, uh, uh, Coticons, which is the largest construction company in Vietnam, and uh, the aim of this project is to find, with the help of crowdsourcing, the most uh, dangerous and the most important risks and threats uh, which uh, urban residents can face in next, say, 20, 30 years, and to find the solutions, how to make uh, the life for urban residents in the most advanced cities, but in, maybe in the old, uh, in, uh, big cities in the world, more comfortable uh, and more safe. So we just finished the first stage of this project. We, uh, we found a lot of interesting findings came from a volunteer experts participating in this project. And these findings are about uh, the role of education, the, about the uh, role of the future work, about the role of uh, creating more parks, for instance, in uh, the cities, in preventing the most dangerous risks and threats in the future cities in the world. Thank you. Thank you, Mikhail, for the view. So, uh, Bill, uh, any comments from you on... Uh what I'm calling as environmental social governance and especially climate risk and how you think about it. Well, I, 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 right. I hate to sound like a impractical idealist uh, staring at the stars, but uh, you know, we have evolved a value system over thousands of years that is adapted to a world uh, that doesn't have 8 billion people in it. Uh, our, our value system today is one that works probably very well in a world with a billion people in it. And uh, because 
if there are only a billion people in the world, um, if I, I want to burn wood, I don't affect the climate very much. And uh, so, and, and I, I realize that we need things possibly like carbon taxes and what have you, but, I, I, you know, trying to deal with this by regulation uh, means that we're going to be passing rules and laws, uh, you know, that are going to become stacks of legal documents. And what we really need to be thinking about is living in a world that has a different fact. Uh, is a perfect example of it. Um, um, we, uh, I, 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 I want to see everybody fully vaccinated and I want to see everybody behaving in responsible ways. And we tried to deal with that in our country by various edicts and what have you. And it, it, there was a, 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 a rejection and a polarization that evolved as a result of it. And that kind of social values do not work in a world with 8 billion people. So uh, it, it's uh, like Mikhail is pointing out, if, uh, if um, we're, we're going to uh, be able to deal with these threats, uh, we're ultimately going to have to evolve to a different value system. Now that's that's that that's a, that's a, a key insight there, Bill. Uh, and I would I would uh, highlight that the the regulations have a limited role to play. You know, sometimes we over regulate ourselves and create more complexity. The conversation that we were having earlier before the session started in our lives, in our societies, in our governance, and the answer sometimes could be simpler than that. So I, as I sit here and, you know, as we are coming towards the end of our session here, I am a technologist, I'm an entrepreneur, I'm an, you know, an optimist. The question that I would ask you is, how do you thrive on risk? The risks are given, you know, there is, as I said, there are geopolitical issues emerging. There's, you know, the pandemic, there's issues around the digital uh, challenges or even at the mental issues for individuals, the, the threats that individuals face in that world, how do you thrive on risk? Not just live with risk, but how do you thrive on risk and disruptions that are happening both as an individual, but also as a business or as a society? I want to have some concluding comments from uh, Bill for you, from you first and then Mikhail on that. And I, I really have this concept of thrive on risk as a core philosophy because the world is going to be constantly evolving and changing. Risks are going to multiply, but we still need to thrive as individuals, as a society. Bill? Well, I, I, you know, I agree that we face high risks, and yeah. it, but, you know, as a result, there's going to be very rapid rates of change. And whenever there are very rapid rates of change, it creates tremendous opportunities for people. And uh, so I, I could also say that high risks are associated with a world of opportunity. Now, some of those opportunities are antisocial, but a lot of them uh, can we can do things to uh, serve social needs. So electric cars are an example or clean energy and things like that. No, I fully agree with you on that. And Mikhail, uh, any comments from your side? First of all, I also completely agree with Bill that uh, the cases with high risk are always linked with the cases of uh, huge opportunities. Uh, uh, but my second point is that I don't think that uh, big risks uh, are very dangerous because if you understand the risks, if you can predict the risks, if you know the risks, you can develop the plan how to decrease the risk and how to manage the risk. Uh, the most um, dangerous risks are unpredictable risks, or hidden risks. So maybe you mentioned a lot of important risks, geopolitical risks, uh, uh, climate change, and so on and so forth. 
but maybe we don't understand today the main risk of the next year, the year 2023. Maybe it will be completely different from uh, today's risk. So I think that maybe one of the most important uh, tasks for humanity is to predict risks as early as possible. Yep. And uh, we are, uh, for instance, if you take the year 2019, a lot of people in the world, I think 99% of the people of the world can imagine, uh, can't imagine, uh, couldn't imagine the risk of pandemic. Uh, I'm living, unfortunately, this time very close to uh, uh, the serious uh, military conflict now. And two weeks ago, I didn't, personally, I didn't predict the risk of the war. So we don't have good tools how to predict the risks. And I think that for uh, humanity is one of the biggest challenge, how to predict the hidden risks. Wonderful. I think that's a great backdrop. So, you know, how do you think about predicting the risks, the black swans that might emerge, yeah. uh, you know, and and also, as Bill said, you know, mm-hmm. risks presents tons of opportunities They, In my mind, they are the flip side mm-hmm. of the same coin. And and mm-hmm. and we want to guide the society towards social activities, which are which are, you know, socially legitimate, uh, which add value to the society not antisocial activities, as Bill remarked on, uh, as these opportunities emerge. And I think that's how we learn to thrive on risk and, and be in a world which has disruption. I think with those remarks, I, I want to conclude our session today. I just want to thank you, Bill, for your time to be on this panel. It's been a, a, a most pleasure of mine. And Mikhail, for you as well, uh, uh, all the way from Moscow, as we are uh, sitting here and discussing this topic. So re- really appreciate you. I'm sure it's late in the evening there. And uh, we look forward to continuing this conversation. So thank you all. And we will uh, conclude the session today. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Th- thank you, Bill. Thank you, Mikhail. Right.